All right, everyone, welcome to our, our next class for Lutheranism during the Third Reich. Um, we have finished up Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and now we're moving on to one of the other pastors who was very active in opposing uh, the Nazis uh, during the 1930s. He is probably, though, the least heard of in our time, even though back in that time he may have been the most well-known. Just curiously, how many of you all have heard of him? Martin Niemöller. Yeah, he, he really has vanished into obscurity. Bonhoeffer has really endured as the most memorable opposer of the Nazis. And um, uh, Niemöller, not so much. But we're going to talk about his role and uh, how he was very actively involved. And so we, we start out with a history on him. Um, he was a U-boat commander in the First World War. Uh, and, and then he went into the ministry after the World War ended, in between the two World Wars. Um, he was actually an original, uh, originally a strong supporter of the Nazis. And uh, he had a lot of faith in Hitler. Even as a pastor, he was this way. Um, and, and he was always considered to be a strong nationalist, that, that he was very, you know, he had served in the military. He was very much uh, a supporter of, of Germany, unlike Bonhoeffer, I would say, who was a little bit more critical. Uh, but then he, he later comes to see the Nazi government as a dictatorship. Uh, and I have here, after a meeting in 1934, he actually met with Adolf Hitler in person at one point. Um, but before that, he, he starts uh, the Confessing Church, because remember, we're in the 1930s, and there's a lot of activity happening then. He's arrested in 37, but because he is this former military um, officer, he's, he's granted some leniency for his service. Uh, but nevertheless, he's still imprisoned in the concentration camps of uh, Sachsenhausen and Dachau from 38 to 45. But he did ask to be released from the camp at one point if he would fight in the army, that this was his request. Yeah. So he sort of has this um, conflicted loyalty sense about him. Um, and, and he lived, but he lived a long life after the war as a pacifist. That's him there in the picture when he was in um, his, his naval days as a U-boat officer. And, um, uh, you know, he had a number of photographs taken at the time. This is what he is most famous for. And everybody knows this quote. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Have you all, have you all heard this quote before? Yeah, it's, it's oftentimes overlooked that a Lutheran said this. People will often say a Protestant minister, you know, they don't get specific enough. Um, but that then became the title for a, a book that was written about him called Then They Came For Me. And, and this is probably, um, well, at least most recently, this is the most well-known book about him. Um, and the book is called uh, Then They Came For Me, Martin Niemöller, The Pastor Who Defied the Nazis. And so I, I quote a lot from this book and um, talk about him. Because he does have a, I, I, you know, this is titled the Niemöller Confession, right? And it's always, you hear this said in a lot of speeches and everything when people are concerned about the way their society is going and, and things along those lines. All right, so this is early on in the book. And this gives you a picture of who he was initially. Um, he said nothing when the Gestapo arrested communists, socialists, and Jews, and not because he was timid. As we will see, he was anything but. He was silent because he shared the belief that these groups were anti-Christian and disloyal to Germany. Right, so we talked about this a lot early on in the study, that um, in between the First and the Second World War, Germany was going through a lot of transition, right? They had uh, seen a change in their government from having um, a monarchy or an autocracy that was led by the Kaiser, 
to now moving to a democracy. Um, and with that, you have all these little smaller groups now that are coming along vying for power. And we're going to talk about how um, Christians perceive democracy here at that time in a minute. But um, there were a lot of threats to Christianity itself that were perceived by the church in those days. Um, communism and socialism, Judaism were, were all seen as being antagonistic influences to the church in German society. And so um, especially a lot of the Protestant Germans were on board. Uh, you know, we, they were sort of given uh, the, the two largest parties um, that were forming during that time. You had the Nazi party on one side and then you had um, the Communist Party also. And, you know, Russia had just had its communist revolution back in 1919. And, you know, they were getting rid of Christianity, especially when Stalin comes to power um, a little bit later. And, and the Christians in Germany didn't want that. And Hitler was giving a nod to Christianity and talking about um, the importance of Christianity in terms of the morals of the nation. So... You know, you can see what was was drawing uh, people to him. Of course, early on, you don't know what his full agenda is going to be. So democracy is liberal. For many committed Lutherans, the replacement of the monarchy, the Kaiser, with a government based on the will of the people was not just repugnant politically, but also, and far worse, an affront to God. Democracy was an affront to God. Government by the people ignored the most basic truth about mankind, the reality of human sin. Protestant church leaders blamed thinkers like Karl Marx and Jean-Jacques Rousseau for propagating delusions about the nobility of man and the sovereignty of the people. Right. So they were saying these things because, um, you know, you had um, the Enlightenment, which had taken place centuries before that, but you still had um, a lot of this um, belief that that man now was advancing in his um, scientific knowledge and in, in his capability, right? You had Darwin and evolution happening uh, maybe about, you know, 50, 60 years before this. Um, they were... Uh, you know, having great ships that could cross the seas, um, they could communicate um, over large distances. I, I mean, there was a lot of just growing confidence in in humanity, although they had seen some bumps along the way with World War I and the sinking of the Titanic that interrupted that. But still, uh, you know, this notion that these monarchies that had ruled Europe for centuries and centuries now we're giving away to a more um, equality-driven method of, of leadership where, where everybody could have a say, right? But for a lot of the uh, early Lutherans, they didn't like that, right? Because, I mean, you saw the monarchy deposed in Russia that was the, the Christian czar, and it was replaced by this, you know, secular ruling class with Lenin and then later Stalin, which then eventually just became its own dictatorship anyway. Uh, but there was this notion that, that humanity itself was not to be trusted with leadership because of original sin, because the will of the people would be, you know, subject to just whatever. Whereas if you had a, a, a Christian leader, that they would be influenced by Christian beliefs, they would be guided by, uh, the faith of the land, the history of continuing in what their ancestors believed. So they thought they were safer with, you know, with a Kaiser. But this is an interesting quote. The church no longer, with, with democracy coming into Germany, had strong ties to the national government. The three-century-long alliance of throne and altar, from Martin Luther to Wilhelm II, had come to an end. This is the first time Germany is seeing a democracy in its whole history. And, and they had uh, all of these centuries now where, you know, um, since the, the end of, of the papal influence on the Germans, and then Martin Luther brings about Protestantism, uh, 
and uh, Protestantism has an effect on the rulers of Germany for all these centuries. Wilhelm II is the final Kaiser. Um, and so you have this connection here of, of throne and altar as it's being quoted and uh, it's coming to an end. Yes, John David. So is that many of the uh, German princes supported Hitler because they believed Hitler would bring the restoration of the monarchy. Yes, I mean, th there was some... Personally, it's binding. Right, and so if, if World War I ends, um, it, you know, what was it, 1919, 1920-something, and then you have, uh, you know, about 12, 13 years before we get to 1933, in between those two time periods is when you have the installation of the democracy. But as I had said also, democracy brought a lot of interesting things to Germany, art, culture, things that they were appreciating, but it also brought a lack of morality. And I, I said this before, like pornography. Um, a lot of people were not crazy about um women's roles now moving outside the home, women were moving into the workforce. Uh, people felt Germany was becoming less family oriented, uh, less home centered. And, uh, you know, so people don't know this, but, but when Hitler came to power, what, you know, I think, I'm not sure if he forbade women from having those positions outside the home as much. But there was certainly a movement in Germany for that, for women. Let's see. There there was like a threefold quote that women's lives should be about. It all started with K. And I know one was kinder for children. I forget what the other two things were. What which was. Oh, that's right. I should, I should know that one. Um, children, church, and kitchen. That's that is right, Bonnie. That is right. So, um, and even during the, the last stages of the war, the Nazis were reluctant to give women combat roles. Yeah, it was only when the fight for you was a shortage of available of personnel, right? That women were more willing to draft as a two second. Yeah, at the very end when it, you know, everything was was done by that point. Okay. All right. So, um, as I said before, Niemöller originally supports Hitler's rise to power, but but his mind is changed by by two developments: the rise of the German Christian movement throughout Germany, which threatened the church with a state takeover, right? Because Hitler could could rule the church through the German Christians. Uh, and the enactment of the Aryan paragraph to remove Jews from civil service positions, potentially even that of the pastoral office, since the pastoral office was a state paid position, right? This threatened the efficacy of baptism also. And we're going to talk about that um, at, at the end. Um, so now uh, it's you, you see the writing on the wall. You see how... Uh, you know, that the Nazis don't just want to uh, increase the visibility of the church, but they want to run the church and they want to have their ideals as part of the church. So Nimor ends up um, joining or even maybe even founding what was called as a, a young reformers movement to oppose the German Christians. And also he founds the Pastors Emergency League, the PEL, and then later the Confessing Church. Right. And this was in response to all of this that was happening in 1933. As uh, as as the German Christians were growing in power and Hitler himself was was furthering this this aim, this objective. Right. So. Remember, Hitler comes to power as chancellor in 1933 in January with the burning of the Reichstag. Right. We, we know that story. Um, but in July of 33, he calls for new church elections um, because he wants to move more of the German Christians into positions of leadership um, in, um, in the regional churches, right? So then the young reformers engage in this campaign to keep the church faithful. They publish pamphlets with titles like, we struggle for a confessing church against false teaching in the church like that expressed 
daily by the leaders of the German Christians. So they're, they're keeping Hitler out of it, even though they may know that he supports the German Christians, but they're just focusing on the German Christians as their enemy because they don't want to rile up you know, the state. So a week before the elections, the Gestapo raids Niemöller's office and confiscates thousands of pieces of campaign literature that, that the government now is getting involved in opposing the church, right? And, and even the Gestapo is, is involved in this. Uh, and then the night before the election, Hitler goes on the air. He promotes the German Christian movement and the, and the political parties. The next day in July, they won by a landslide with nearly 70% of the vote. So Hitler was able to get all of his people into those positions. And then later that year in the fall, that's when they have their, their synodical convention. And I talked to you guys previously about the Brown Synod, that it was a church convention, but there were so many churchmen, pastors even, who showed up wearing brown shirts, the Nazi uniforms, that um, it was known as the Brown Synod. Right? So... You know, instead of going as churchmen, they went more as as Nazis. Right, because he he wanted. Um, I I had said this before, but Germany at the time was composed of, I think it was like thirty some odd land churches, which we would see this today as thirty different synods. So, you know, in, in America today, we have like three main synods, right? Missouri, Wisconsin, ELCA, and, you know, there's some smaller ones. But we think about that. But they had 30 in, in Germany, you know, the size of Germany. And, and Hitler did not like all of that, you know, disarray. He wanted, he wanted all those churches to unite under one Reich bishop that was in his pocket. And so that's what he was trying to. Um, to make happen. And, you know, his his reign really begins with trying to get the churches under him because he knows he's not going to have a lot of success um, running the country and moving forward with his agenda if the churches oppose him. And the churches certainly did have the, uh, you know, the theological ammunition to oppose him. So the church was really the greatest, you know, one of the greatest earliest threats to Hitler. He got rid of the other threat in the communists, like I told you about with the Reichstag fire, where the fire is uh, is set and then oh, a communist just happens to be conveniently found walking around holding a lighter. And so then that gives him an excuse to go and arrest all the communists. So he's got them out of the way. Now he's got to get, you know, the, the Christians, uh, the Protestants in line as well. So he writes this, uh, Niemöller writes this letter to the young reformers uh, early on. Because of the distress in the churches, we have called into being an emergency league of pastors who have given one another their word in a written declaration that they will be bound in their preaching by Holy Scripture and Reformation confessions alone, and that they will alleviate the distress of those brethren who have to suffer for this. So there's a recognition that there's going to be suffering in the church. Um, you know, Bonhoeffer is also calling for a recognition of a suffering among the Jewish people that, that, you know, as Christians, we have a responsibility to suffer with those even who are not Christians. Right. And so Bonhoeffer is really pushing that, but at least in the church, they, they have this type of a, of an understanding. All right, now, Niemöller and Bonhoeffer actually meet each other. And um, this is an interesting quote from the book. Uh, Bonhoeffer first met Niemöller in early summer 1933. Uh, although they agreed about the need to fight the German Christian threat, they did not see eye to eye on much else. Their backgrounds could not have been more different. Bonhoeffer's family was liberal, cosmopolitan, academic, and unequivocally anti-Hitler. Niemöller, proud of his Navy days and pleased with the rise of a strong 
charismatic leader, was intent on demonstrating national loyalty even under Hitler. So you, you have these two very different uh, mindsets about the, the Nazis early on and, and Hitler and the rise of someone like a Fuhrer, right? But at the same time, they recognize that there are these elements that are in opposition to the church's confession. And, and so they both come together really under that uh, umbrella. Uh, Bonnie. Um, that would have probably been written in 1933. Yeah, I mean, everything, is, there's so much happening in, in 33 um, towards the church. And, you know, we, we, we uh, looked at some of those German Christian movement slides where they're actually campaigning outside of the churches with the Nazi swastikas. People get out of church on Sunday morning and they run into the swastikas that they want the vote um, from the churchgoers so that uh, the German Christians will have the representation when this national synod meets um, later that year in the fall, right? And so they start comp campaigning. Hitler calls for new elections in July, and then they're going to have this, their synodical convention in the fall. And so, uh, yeah. But Niemöller and some of the others are campaigning. Uh, to to try and thwart the German Christian movement, um, but if obviously they they end up losing those elections, right? All right. So um, I have here the Arian paragraph is unbiblical. Baptism erases all previous distinctions among people and creates a church based on confession and faith. The communion of the saints is about our new identities in Christ. This was a hill to die on, and some did. Right? This was this was something to go to the mat for. So let's let's look up some of these verses here. Revelation seven verse nine. Anyone there? One of our stained glass windows depicts this. Bonnie, I'm not. No, Bonnie, are you there? Okay, go ahead, Rusty. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the thrones in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. So this is depicted in the last stained glass window we have in the sanctuary on the on the right. People in white robes with palm branches standing before Christ as he you know administers his supper. Um, but this also emphasizes uh, the the fact that Israel is non-geographical. The church is non-geographical. The Great Commission from Matthew 28 says, go and make disciples of all nations, right? The Greek word for nations is ethne. It's where we get the word ethnic from. And so at the end of the gospel, you know, uh, the disciples are called not to just stay around Israel and to convert the Jewish people, but to go out into all the nations of the world to bring in people of every tribe and tongue and, and race. Um, and, and you have so many stories about that in the Gospels, you know, for, for that to happen. Right. And, you know, we had said before that uh, if you had, do you guys remember what I said the rule was for how Jewish you had to be to be dismissed? Like what, 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 what would make you, what percentage of your ancestry would make you Jewish? One grandparent. Yep. One of the four. So if you're 25% Jewish, then you are Jewish. You could not hold uh, a civil service position in the government. And um, the, the Synod was going to be about adopting the Aryan paragraph for the church. Like early on, when they passed the Aryan paragraph in, in the state legislature, that was just for the government positions. But then um, it was going to get passed in the church by that Brown Synod, right? So that's when uh, that arises or that, you know, creates all of this opposition to Hitler and, and the German Christians, because now they're trying to basically say, 
your identity before baptism still matters. That, you know, if you were Jewish before, baptism does not erase your Judaism. And that's not how we understand baptism, as we're going to get to here in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Um, Donna, are you there? Okay. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Abraham's seed, a descendant of Abraham. And notice that how baptism does erase all of the distinctions. And Paul is very clear about that in, in what he says. Um, and, and, you know, think about the three divisions that are mentioned here. Jew or Greek, which was a very huge division at the time, uh, that the Jews, you know, you remember that um, at the Passover, they don't even want to be in Pilate's presence. He's got to appear like on the balcony or something because they don't want to have contact with him before they eat the Passover. Uh, uh, male or female, right, which was another division of the time, and then slave or free, right, which would have been more of a probably a Roman understanding. But but that baptism does, uh, in effect, create equality among all these different peoples of socioeconomic status, race, gender, um, and then what you were before in terms of your Jewish identity now does not not continue. Right. All right. And then a few verses earlier here, Galatians 2, 11 to 14. Uh, Bonnie. But when Stephen came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood for me. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the persecution of them. And the rest of the Jews acted suspiciously along with him. So that even Barnabas was known as great by that nation. Even Barnabas. When I saw that their conduct did not instruct the truth of the gospel, I sent to Peter and told him all. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you think the Gentiles to be accepted? So what is he saying here? What's the argument? Cephas. Cephas, Peter, yep. Out of context, because there are Christians that all people who do a baptism are evil. He behaved in a manner without offending the uh, Jewish Christian. Right, now, now notice both of these last two arguments come from the book of Galatians. Right, and so Galatians is is a, a letter that Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, which would have been like um, Iconium and Derby and Lystra, places in in those areas, cities in those areas. Um, they were falling under heavy influence of the Judaizers, so they had become Christians, and the Judaizers were people who basically went into those areas and said, well. You have to become Jewish before you become Christian. You have to get circumcised before you get baptized. You have to observe the feast days. You have to observe the dietary laws. You have to do all that first. And, and so now Paul is, is writing to them basically, you know, if you remember early on in Galatians, you know, foolish Galatians who has bewitched you, right? Even if we preach to you another gospel, you know, whoever preaches to you another gospel, let him be accursed. So to say that you have to become something else before you become Christian, again, annuls the gospel because it, it, it gives a pre-requirement. And it says Jesus is not enough. You've got to do this other stuff first. Right. So Paul says, no, baptism erases those distinctions. And the, the issue here is that Peter had come to town and there were both Jews and Gentiles in a certain place, and uh, all the Jews were eating together, and Peter went and ate with the Jews because he did not want them to think he was not, like, loyal to his Jewish roots and things like that. And so he, but he gave the impression that the Gentiles were somehow lesser people, lesser Christians. And so Paul then 
sees him and opposes him to his face, calls him out and says, you cannot bring this kind of segregationism back into the church. We don't do this anymore. You know, Paul or uh, Peter was going back to probably what he grew up with and what had been so ingrained in him. And so Paul has to call him out. So it, it's interesting that Galatians, you know, really, um, uh, really talks about this notion that we that there's an equality among Christian believers. And, and you know, in, in during the Nazi era, Hitler was coming along and saying, no, there's not. And, and so now as the, the church, you get into this dilemma where you have these verses like, okay, obey your leaders, Romans 13, but, oh, baptism erases all of these distinctions, Galatians 3. And so this is a case now where the church really has to stand up and oppose the government and oppose Hitler. And and many of them get that, but many of them do not, right? And so you don't have a, a Lutheranism in Germany at this point, a widespread Lutheranism that was really uh, educated enough in, in the confessions to understand this point, right? They were caught up in the nationalism. They were caught up in, oh, let's, you know, um, let's take vengeance upon those who impose this Treaty of Versailles on us. Uh, this is Germany, it's blood, it's soil. Uh, let's combine Christianity with that, sort of like the way people try and, and mix creationism and evolution, right? They're trying to cover all their bases, and the Germans were trying to do that with nationalism and faith, and then they lost sight of, of the faith. And the people who were trying to stick up for the true beliefs of scripture and the confessions were now seen as opposing uh, Germany, right? You were not a faithful German if you were opposing what Hitler was doing. And so that's, you know, this is, this is where all our conflict is, is coming in. Any questions, thoughts? Someone who is, you know, supporting the government. Yeah, well, he 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 didn't want to have to make the decision that he did. Um, the question is that he sounds like he was someone supporting the government, and he really wanted to. He really wanted to look at at Hitler as I hate to say it, but the savior who was going to save them from, you know, the immorality of democracy and the communism, all these things, right? And so, um. You know, he's a former U-boat commander. You know, he loves the military. He loves German history. He loves German culture. Uh, but yet, he's got to draw the line when it infringes upon his faith. <laughs> well, later in the day, for sure. But I yeah 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 and so that's why it's interesting that you have two very different people and you know we won't spend as much time on Nimor as we did on Bonhaver because Nimor doesn't um he doesn't write a lot but he has an interesting story that we'll you know continue on with next week and then after him we'll move on to Herman Sasa who was uh a very well-known at the time theologian and this really being revived among a lot of Lutherans today. So, all right, but let's go ahead and let's, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the witness of these men in the past who confessed uh, our faith in the face of opposition and antagonism. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us equally bold in our witness, uh, in our culture, um, that people would hear the truth of Jesus and believe. In his name we pray. Amen.